have been southward. All the people to their south were in Barra uh, and then Basara. So Sitswana is the only language which will say Sara. And uh, for what reason I have not yet really uh, come to explain, but you will find the word for some among the southern party to be toa, toa in Zulu, Aba, toa, in Shona, Aba, toa, and then uh, in Kalanga, they'll say Ba, toa. So it will be something. And then in every instance, you find it in every language that you find it, it means someone who has no agriculture, a hunter gatherer. So the pygmies are also. Yeah. So that's how they are. And when I go up, you know, to really, you know, uh, my my father kept kept me so you go to, you know, you mark your territory by taking your cattle to the furthest. And the people who were there were this uh, uh, the sun. I'll, I'll, I'll insist on the sun, uh, the sun, because you know when you have koi sun, you have certain people within what we call sun who speak the language of the koi, koi. And so it's a mix-up, and then it will take a long time to to get to that. And therefore, early in childhood, I had this consciousness that there is these other people who are not us. Uh, so, uh, it's part of how you would uh, create an identity or construct an identity. And the cattle keeper would then force the non cattle keeper to keep cattle. So, from the first instance, there is this violation and it is historical. Uh, you impose it. On people who are culturally different, you want to impose your own civilizational values. So the history of the sun, the quay sun in southern Africa, has something to do with all these violences imposed by those who believed were culturally superior. Uh, Botswana, Bakalanga and all the others. Even the Nama, the Kwekwe, they have that attitude towards some of the people who speak even their languages. So the word Bushman that you find in certain literature was essentially constructed by the Nama. It's not the European. Many people think it's the European Bushman. Because to the Sen, the Nama people had such kind of aversion, aberration, and the rejection based on uh, the cultural uh, peculiarities. So I am dealing here with the, the Sen people of Botswana, and I'm trying to say, are they under colonialism? And I'll try to really interrogate this subject as I go on. So I'll start by saying in his book, Empire, a very short introduction, this is how, in 2002, discusses the notion and entailment of internal colonialism as a development state where within a country there is an uneven development which results in one group exploiting the other. Internal colonialism, therefore, is a rebirth of historical empires uh, and this time around within a state. Most of the unevenness in development occur due to differences either in language, in culture, in history, in geography, in mode of food production, or in cultural behavior. These constitute factors that characterize the determination or the differentiation 
within the state that cause inequalities. In Europe, the historical experiences of the gypsies, wanderers, especially in Eastern Europe, will constitute instances of internal colonialism. In the Nordic countries, disarming historically went through that kind of uh, um, uh, experiences. And in France and uh, Spain, the Yuskal Dunak uh, uh, also, even now, they believe they went other uh, internal colonials. The Siberians in Russia also have historically similar experiences of internal colonialism and in other worlds the aborigines in the Australia uh, the Amerindians and the now coming to Africa the hunter gatherers wherever you find them in the Congo uh, in Ethiopia in southern Africa they are under internal colonialism if we are to take how 2002 definition of internal colonialism. But let us start with a theoretical issue and quote uh, Paida Kukus, who says, who states that with the demise of Europe's system of direct colonialism, some have rushed to proclaim the death of colonialism and the advent of post-colonialism. In that narrative, colonialism, like its despicable cousin, uh, the transatlantic slavery, is portrayed as only in history. But post-colonial studies go in many directions. They may be anti-colonial or may ignore the economic exploitation they may be too radical or not radical enough. They may or may not speak for the subaltern. Uh, this is also found in Luumba 2005. Uh, and then the writings on postcolonialism are wash with inconsistencies and confusion with the problem of definition scope and validity. So this is also Haida Hughes who states this uh, from this uh, 2011 publication. So, he says this, a geographically based pattern of subordination of a, dif of a differentiated population located within the domain, the dominant uh, power or country. This subordination by a dominant power has the outcome of systematic group inequality expressed in the policies and practices of a variety of societal institutions, including systems of education, uh, where you say this is the national language, everyone is the national language, and the other, whether his language subsists or not subsists, you don't care. So that's what he, he talks about. It could also be in, in, uh, in uh, cultural production, uh, where you could say, okay, this is Botswana culture. Whether there could be any variance, whether there could be any other, you, you are less concerned. So, internal colonial colonialism practices can be very subtle and sophisticated according to certain uh, countries. So, it is imperative, therefore, to understand that when you talk of internal colonialism within the post-colonial theory, you may be talking of so many other things. Some nearing violence, some accommodating, some diametrically different from what is generally held as uh, uh, internal colonialism. So in these discourses, post-colonialism covers a set of theories found in many disciplines, such as philosophy, political science, uh, 
uh, human geography, sociology, feminism, religious and, and uh, theological studies, film, literature, you can name them all. They have uh, different uh, approaches to that. So in history, uh, we are content as Africans to say Africa has been colonized and most often we are content when we think of this colonialism as coming from elsewhere and uh, we will then construct our discourse of, uh, of colonialism around this foreignness of, um, of colonialism. What is most uh, memorable in Black Africa uh, is really this experience of the scramble for Africa, which made Africa into tiny little countries, some not countries at all, which started around 1865 to 70, when actually the border started to be uh, prepared and according to European uh, colonies. So that's what an African would cherish politically as a colonialism, but uh, we're going to see further uh, the sort of other entailments uh, that uh, are coming out of that. So on these grounds, and because it has, Africa has been inhabited through, throughout mostly by tribal people, the African continent and its constant, and its constant population did not qualify a subject of international law. So when, when Africa was divided into uh, interests, so uh, this is what, uh, so Europeans, because Africans were not a nation, they were tribal, we say then there is no right to do that. And in turn, Africans themselves within their territory, because others among them uh, don't have a culture, a territory, a tribe, you exercise the same sort of thing, this time with a cleaner, or oh, let me put, paraf put it in parentheses, uh, a cleaner conscience, because maybe to be a black to black, and you won't see even the, 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 the racial difference. So that's what really, for many instances in Africa, internal colonialism by Africans has been so much tolerated to a point that, uh, you know, even big uh, UN bodies, uh, UNESCO, you may say, uh, United Nations uh, Center for Human Rights, they don't see that. They don't even believe that could happen. So that's really the argument that is coming out of here. So when the, the socio-political conditions uh, between uh, these Africans now take uh, this uh, uh, perspective of we are Africans and we are brothers and, uh, and so you nicely impose, nicely do all the violations of human rights. Uh, so I'm skipping, but uh, I think uh, I'm making that point. So in, in the neo-colonial sort of a perspective, uh, we therefore try to accommodate this uh, attitude as Africans. So in Botswana, uh, the example that we get is of the mainline main society, which is Botswana. Uh, when you go to other people who are not, not Christian, the Kalanga, the Herero, you know, because they can come to a common culture, which is the culture of the cow, huh? so mm -hmm. the, 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 the Nama they call them, those of culture of the cow, the Gomsekwe, uh, those that keep the cow. So they've got a common accommodation as against a hunter-gatherer. So whether you are a Mutuana, you are a Kalanga, you are a Herero, you are what? You still have the same attitude that when analyzed will lend you to that kind of a definition that we've seen earlier on. So the Khoisan people, 
have this kind of segregation or this kind of uh, internal apartheid, let, let me say, where they are really apart. Uh, they are not part of us. And for them to be part of us, you must forcibly assimilate them, bring them to the fold by all forces of culture. And the first instance of uh, this violation is when you want them to speak your language as if they did not have a language. You want them to live like you as if they did not have, have a life. So these are some of the things that uh, need emphasis and if they are happening, they need to be described as uh, internal uh, colonialism. So there is also in this accommodation this persistent biological metaphors. Languages are born, no, they grow, they subside, they contribute to a common sense. If you see, just because it's now a, a hackney chant within major societies that there is better, you say Latin, you know, died, Greek was Greek, and then it died, we no longer have a classical Greek. So these are some of the accommodations that we take. So, and then you say, now, what's wrong with uh, quests and languages dying? What is wrong? Because the language, the culture can, can live and die. So it's like a, a soul which can live and die. So these accommodations, I consider them violations. And they overlook the role of language and culture in the life of a person or of a, a group of people. Language and culture have a social and historical role to identify people and to give them the, what shall I call it, uh, a biological reason to exist on this earth. Uh, so, um, when someone can speak his or her language, it's not just speaking. There is a whole experience of reality that is surrounded that. There is a whole definition of who you are, and there is a whole purpose of conveying a dynamic culture. So, when you easily say someone must take your language, you are automatically saying, that person has nothing, not even a culture, not even a culture. So these are some of the violations that you get. Um, I'll skip other material, I'll clean the paper and then distribute it among, to, to you. So the other point here is, uh, it was said by our President before the one who, who, who retired a year ago, that we are all Batwana. So where, where is the problem? We are all, I mean, a president can be a Bushman. A president <laughs> can be anything. So, yes, could be. <laughs> but it's also very superficial to reason like that. Uh, it's not true, actually. Because it says, be something else for you to be what uh, the, men, uh, the men like culture would consider. So it's not true that Rasi Sana, the man with the little horns, you could put him in his culture as president of Botswana. No one would accept democratically. So he must convert and be you. That's when you will accept him. So these are some of the things that are happening that we see around. So the African ruling uh, uh, politicians, uh, who have most of them wrestled power from uh, the colonial master, will not accept that uh, you, you even talk of a certain indigenous population 
a certain Aboriginal population, all of them, yeah, in the Congos, uh, South Africa, here, Botswana, none of them would accept that there is anyone more indigenous than themselves. So, uh, to nicely uh, refuse that, you say, okay, let us be homogeneous, let us be one, so that we don't talk of this diversity. So, this is one uh, argument that is coming out. So, while the, this colonial discourse or from the African perspective, um, while the colonial discourse cons uh, considered all black Africans, Khoi and some people, indigenous, at independence, all African countries without exception prescribed the term uh, indigenous to mean a homogenizing kind of a term so that you settle, you settle the argument by saying we are all Batwana, we speak Setwana, and we are culturally homogeneous. So, the fact of history is contrary to some of these thinking, is that Khoisan people, their languages are different. And the best that you can do for them is to allow them to be different. One time there was an international conference here on uh, uh, remote area Jurassic Transform, so the little commission. And then uh, Roy Sisana, you may not know him, but he's uh, one of uh, the, the advocates and the first people of the Kalahari group and then the other, other grouping. He was saying, they give us cattle to keep. But Kepo is the culture of a Mutwana. <laughs> and they tire as these animals, you end up killing them. So there was, there was a Herero man from uh, Namibia. He loved the whole week of the conference. He said, what? What man would ever be so mad as to kill a cow? <laughs> because you know, in Herero culture, which is like Sutwana culture, like Kalan culture, when you have a son, you give him a female calf. When he's 25, that animal has more than 50 animals. They have that stewardship of cattle husbandry that they believe is even biological. So they won't even imagine the craziness of the world that a man, even as big as that man, could be given five cows and end up killing them. What outrage <laughs> and sacrilege, I would think. So, we content ourselves with uh, this kind of thing because we don't want to believe that um, a hatha gatherer culture is a culture. My father did not believe that a hunter-gatherer has a territory. It was Kalanga, not even Wato, Kalanga. So where they are, you just put your cattle and evict them. So that violence of culture has always subsisted and it is perpetrated in very subtle, some of these forms are even salient where you have state programs put in place so that you completely settle that argument. So the socio-political landscape of Botswana is fraught with these violences and therefore you cannot hope that the hunter-gatherer in Botswana will have the right to exist as a hunter-gatherer. He is told in school where his language is not allowed. He is told even in a public gathering where his language or culture is not allowed that he is the main group. He's not 
what he can do. So, community, uh, Quezon communities in Botswana are uh, much pretty in what I call internal colonialism. They do not qualify as an independent tribe. Uh, they can only be Bangwatu, they can only be Batawana, they can only be Bangwakesi, they can only be Bakalakaji. They can be, they can only be any other person than themselves. So that's what is there. And uh, they can only be educated in someone's language. Allocated land that has, uh, uh, that is under the authority of someone. This is some of the things that Soka started in 2001, uh, argued. And therefore, uh, when they argue that they need land, people are just so surprised. A hunter gatherer wanting land to do what? <laughs> what is he going to do? What what is he going to graze? You know, <laughs> some of uh, the people say, oh, "You want land?" Uh, so, so these are some of the problems uh, and uh, some of uh, the issues. Uh, that uh, we've been grappling with in um, in, in advocacy uh, societies in Southern Africa. So the this state authority, which is pervading in all areas where these people like to feel the right to belong. Uh, I'm saying this is where the violations are happening. And really, if we're a country which could do better, that uh, the little that can be done is really to allow them to express themselves and define themselves and occupy certain spaces in the cultural and linguistic domain. Uh, so let me just not be later because I think I've amply made the those demonstration that uh, uh, we need going, going forward understand that uh, the Khoisan of Botswana uh, have basic rights. We need as a country maybe move to what we call the third generation rights the personal rights that give you the right to exercise your personal freedom. I have in the conclusion uh, these questions. Bushwana should endeavor to answer these third generation rights questions and I pick them from uh, the recent declaration, Punta del Este Declaration of uh, uh, December 2018. And these are the arguments through this question. Can the idea of human dignity for everyone, everywhere, help with the implementation of human rights through progressive measures? And these progressive measures are measures that cater for personal rights. And then the other question is, can it enable, enable the vision of human rights to, come, to become a common standard of achievement of all people and all nations everywhere? And can the idea of human dignity help reconcile competing human rights claims and resolve tensions with other important national and social interests. And finally, can the idea of human dignity provide insight into the nature of, digni of uh, dignity harms and identity politics in the midst of the conscious, conscious wars? I thank you. Yes. <laughs> I have to comment before yes. you can raise.
ask your questions. Oh. Thank you very much, Professor Tobani. You can take a seat while I comment, okay. and I'll call you back to the podium. A very interesting topic indeed, especially for us as Botswana. A spectre that sits stately in our country and is the elephant in the room that for the most part we never talk about. And here, Professor Chobani is challenging us to come out of our comfort zone and look at some of the injustices meted against uh, some of the minority groups in Botswana. I'd like just to start by sharing, and Professor Chobani knows that, that some of the topics covered about the Botswana, the, the same people in history and in sociology. Some creative writers such as Bessie Head have also taken time to write about those issues. One book that comes to mind in particular is her book, Maru with Margaret Cadmore. Some of my literary friends who are here, I think, will be interested in sharing some of the with them. And Professor Chabane raises uh, some theoretical uh, stuff when she uh, echoes Spivak on the issue of can the subaltern speak? And then my next question will be, are we allowing the subaltern being the son in Botswana to speak for himself or herself? Professor Chavani says, no, we are not. Because first of all, we've cut their tongue by not allowing them to use their own languages or their own dialects. And Professor Chavani took us also to the geopolitics and the ethnographic uh, internal colonialism in Botswana. As Botswana, as Professor Chavani rightly put it, we have pushed the same people into being into owning cattle when they are intrinsically uh, hunters and gatherers. So we are taking them and putting them in our Merata cattle posts and expect them to stay there to take care of our valued Tsana uh, cattle. And I think they have a home then would have said, oh, Mombe, because they, <laughs> they, <laughs> they, 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 they keep cattle. Um, no, if we take the debate outside Botswana and look at Africa and the world, there are many forms of modern day slavery, whether it's in the US or whether it's in West Africa, where people pick up cocoa and then they don't even eat the chocolate, <laughs> neither do they enjoy the freshly brewed coffee in some parts of the world. And what I liked about uh, Professor Chabani's plenary is how he takes us back to what Fanon said. He said, um, to learn a language is to assume that culture. And in a way, or to a certain extent, I've learned English and maybe I have some English mannerisms, or like my forefathers and the people in Dublin, people are still wearing pinstripe suits to go to meetings when they temperatures are like 39 degrees Celsius. So, because we've learned that language, the language of tea, we consume a lot of tea in Bhutan. I don't know how many tea breaks are in the program right now. Have you checked? <laughs> <laughs> so you always have to be aware that whether you learn French or you learn English, then you are, by virtue of speaking that language, somehow internalizing the culture of the language that you are emulating. In this case, we are, have all inherited different colonial languages in Africa. We don't even divide our countries according to, this country speaks Lingala, this one speaks Swahili. We are Lusophone, Francophone, and Anglophone, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And uh, Professor Chabani also talked about uh, the myth of national identity that no matter how fraught a country is with problems, whether it's gender inequality, racial inequalities, all these diversities are silenced through the myth of one nation. And in most African countries, we sing that song every day. In Botswana, we pride ourselves like Rebatswana. We are Botswana. 
Uh, historian Benedict Anderson says, nation states are imagined communities. Because we imagine we are together just because we hold one passport, which is the Botswana passport. And I think through his deliberations, uh, Professor Chaban just showed us like, that's a myth because what we want, the straight jacket that we want to force the same people into is not their preference, but probably the preference of the state. Take them out of the bush and take them into schools. Can we have schools in their environment where we teach them about indigenous knowledge systems? Um, yep, and he concluded by looking at some of the state apparatus, we're aware of the work of Louis Althusser, that the three state apparatus are the family. In our families, we are indoctrinated to think that by the Sun people are less than us as Batswana. I get it. And then is the church. What does the church say about uh, different um, hierarchies in the church? And of course the school, the most basic place of indoctrination. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'd like us to give a round of applause to mm -hmm. Professor Chavanis. some time because immediately after here we're not going to have the second set of presentation we'll go for lunch because the lunch people wouldn't wait for it and then we'll resume the discussions uh, in the afternoon but can i please have questions yeah. uh, yes yes